Hello, and welcome to the Revenue Enablement Podcast, where we work backwards from the broken B2B buying experience and explore what modern revenue teams can do to fix it. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Magnaca. On behalf of the Revenue Enablement Podcast, I want to welcome you to this brief conversation with my friend Roderick Jefferson. Roderick, let's jump right in. And can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background and how you became an expert in the sales enablement arena? I started as a sales guy, as a BDR. Did really well. As it happens, you get promoted to AE, then got promoted to surprise sales leader. I actually turned it down because I realized I loved the process of selling more than I did taking down big deals. So I talked to my VP and said, what if I could give you two problems that I guarantee you'll love? One, I can help more people to hit quota. And secondly, I can help you have to go back and get more budget for people going to club because you'll have so many. And he said, if you can do that, you've got a new job. So I talked myself into a a sales training position at the time. And about uh, 18 years ago, I created this little nomenclature called sales enablement. Let's pivot to a concept that you talked about on an enablement that you did, which was all about this idea of orchestration. I'd just like to go a little bit deeper in terms of what does it mean to be an orchestrator of the revenue team? I think there are kind of three components to this, and it is literally collaboration, communication, and orchestration. The first piece is making sure that everyone is working in the right direction. We're all rowing together, right? Making sure that everyone gets what they need at the right time, at the right level, and the right depth. I think the key to all of this is the orchestration, right? I literally akin enablement to the orchestra master. And there are strings, woodwind, percussion, and they're all trying to play the right song. But the problem is they step over each other. They've got bad notes. They're out of tune, out of phase. Same thing happens inside of a company. Corporate America says we all have to do this one way. No, we really don't. Think about this from a a company perspective. We're all trying to do the right thing on behalf of our prospects and our customers, but just like that orchestra, sometimes the left hand right isn't aware of what the right hand is doing. We're stepping over each other. We're dual messaging and we're confusing the market until just like an orchestra, one person who I believe is sales enablement steps up, taps that stand, and all of that noise and chaos becomes a beautiful sheet of music. But here's the biggest piece that comes out of it. Enablement has to be allowed, and I will say that in in finger quotes, right? And, And emboldened to be that orchestra master. We have to trust enablement enough to say, we brought you in and this is what you do best. Let's allow you to do those pieces. I'm just trying to think about for so many of the people who are listening to this who are in enablement themselves, some are wondering, what is the scope of enablement using the metaphor you've just described? How much should I be doing? And then if I'm a C-level executive and I'm thinking about what do I want my sales enablement team to do? It's been a pretty narrow remit for a long time. If I'm hearing you, you're saying that it's a lost opportunity opportunity to not expand what this group can actually do. Oh, absolutely. And and I'll take it a step further. I think it's time to step away from sales enablement and really focus on revenue enablement. There's an opportunity to really look at it from a go-to-market perspective. And I'm talking about sales, BDRs, solution consultant, SEs, AEs, leaders, and all the way including your customer success and your client success. Because if we're not all moving in the same direction, we've got a problem and it's going to break. And who's it going to hurt? It's going to hurt your prospects. It's going to hurt your customers, your clients, right? That is a really good point, Roderick, recognizing that HR and L&D and it and enablement can all work together but they really do have different functions what i know is that the biggest problem with onboarding and almost everybody listening to this has had an experience where it was a poor onboarding experience and what i really mean by that is it didn't feel like they actually cared about your experience and so to the extent that there's somebody like enablement whose job it is to help shepherd you through the process and help be the one to introduce you to the IT department and then find out, oh, you haven't gotten your computer for a week. Let's work together to get this thing resolved. Too often, it's a transaction. I liken it to a train moving down a track that has literally, according to Gallup, 52 stops for the average new hire in the first 90 days. And each stop is a disjointed experience. I talked with HR today. I talked with benefits to yes, you know, the next day. And so on and so on down the path. Instead of recognizing, hey, we've got a way that we do this. We're going to get you up and running. And little by little, we're going to be getting you inculcated into the culture. But we're not going to just leave you to your own devices. 
having been in enablement for quite a while now, I've realized that it's probably the most broken part of every company I've been in for the reason you just said. And it all begins with kind of two things. One, HR and enablement have been siloed, for lack of yeah. a better word, right? You go through orientation, stop. Now we're going to hand you off to enablement, stop. Now we're going to hand you off to your leader or your mentor, stop. What if we thought about this more as a continuous and contiguous flow that actually started with HR and enablement sitting down and saying, how do we now build out joint programs that actually are hand in hand versus flowing from one to the other? The other piece goes back to the very first thing I said about one of the responsibilities of enablement, and that is we should be a part of the interview process that helps with both talent assessment and acquisition. And the reason is, one, we're talking their language. We're talking sales speak to these people. Secondly, we're looking at whether or not they have the propensity to go through all of those steps that we talked about from onboarding, everboarding, all those others. And then third, the most important part is because we were one and or we work closely with sales leadership, our BS meter is much higher because yeah. we have to deal with them. I love it, Roderick. Well, on that note, uh, just to recap, we've gone from the power of orchestration all the way through the transformation from sales enablement and the rationale of why revenue enablement actually makes sense. And it makes sense because all the things that were originally started 18 years ago when you answered that question. As it related to salespeople, we, we, we now see that the scope of who this can benefit is greater than just the sales organization. So thanks so much for uh, continuing this conversation. I'm hoping that you're going to be like uh, Bob Newhart was on Johnny Carson's show where he came back year after year because he always had something great to say. My absolute honor. I'll come back anytime the opportunity is here to get together with you, Mark. Thanks again. Terrific, Roderick. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Revenue Enablement Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For Enablement Insights in 60 seconds or less, follow Enable Minutes wherever you scroll.